Hi, I'm Angel Borelli, and welcome to Season 9, Episode 1 of The Fix, and I am here with my guest and favorite coach, Larry Owens, from Bellarmine University. Hey, Larry, I thought we'd never get it together, and the MLB season would never start. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Yep, no problem. Thanks for having me once again. The lockout's over, and uh, looks like we're ready. Well, you know, I always wanted to uh, sort of coordinate the beginning of this season with the beginning of MLB. So the first podcast was scheduled in the middle of February when the pitchers report. And of course, when they didn't, I said, well, I'm going to take extra time. But here we are coincidentally landing on the uh, uh, exact time that they reported. So I'm so happy it's over. And I'm so happy to have you here, not only because you were such a great guest last year, but also because in our conversations that we have so many times when I'm picking your brain about things that coaches question or they need to understand or would love to understand, you asked me something that was so important and it inspired this entire podcast. So do you remember the day we were having a conversation And we were talking about pitches and different things. And then all of a sudden, I think I can mimic you correctly. After I thought we were done talking, you said, oh, and by the way, why the heck do some guys look so slow going down the mound? Do you remember saying that to me? Uh, Absolutely. Exactly. So when, when you said that, I thought to myself, you know, it's an interesting topic because it's, there are many ways to look at that, and I've heard coaches say that before, and also myself doing qualitative analysis. When I'm just watching someone, I might say, hey, he looks pretty slow. And the interesting thing about it is, is when you are looking at the pitching motion, the only part of the motion, other than when you release the ball, that has a direction to it that you could even identify as slow is the stride. And I started thinking to myself, what an interesting thing to look at because the stride, when it's done efficiently, in fact, when you watch major league pitchers that are really good, people always say, God, they throw a hundred and they look like they're doing nothing. And the nothingness usually comes from the smooth way they get down the hill. And I say to myself, it's funny, when when it looks slow, we notice it slow. But when it's efficient, it's not necessarily fast, but it's got an efficiency to it. And I thought, what an interesting part of the motion the stride is. And, and you know, in graduate school, my entire thesis was on the lower body contribution. And I've always been a fan of of trying to understand more and more about the stride, about issues with it, and also about ways to teach it. So the good news is, Larry, I have some information for you today to help uh, talk about this exact issue. The second thing is that's awesome is as what usually happens with me, whenever I'm pondering something, lo and behold, a pitcher will call me And he'll ask me a question that is directly related to exactly the issue I've been pondering. And so here's a very interesting story, and it's going to be the uh, topic for our initial slides. And by the way, everyone, this is definitely a visual podcast today. And while you're going to learn a lot by just listening, if you can listen to this uh, on YouTube at Angel Borelli Pitching, you'll be able to see all the uh, information that we're talking about. So anyway, so Larry, I get this call from a pitcher. He's in college. He's been gone a year from working with me. I worked with him through high school, throwing mid-90s, probably averaging around 93, um, hitting 95, sometimes on a good day a 96. But, you know, we'll call him a a 93, 94-mile-an-hour pitcher. One year in college, He's down to high 80s. So he called me and said, I need for you to tell me what what am I doing? No injuries, nothing like that. So because so he flew in to work with me. And of course, I got some video and I went home after the first day and I said, you know, I'm going to take his film from when he was in high school. And maybe I won't go to when he was throwing the hardest, but he was always in the 90s. I said, let me let me look at some film. 
and let me first do an analysis of just still shots of particular places in the motion that as an analyst we look. And this is very important for everyone to hear because I know some of you are starting to work with film and it's important to know what to look for, although analyzing film is a skill in and of itself. But when we do a biomechanical analysis or a qualitative analysis, which is what I do, we always look at, we take the film and we stop it in certain places. We don't initially look at how they get there. So we look at the top of the knee lift. We look at where the arm is when the foot touches down. So we look carefully as as to where the front foot touches down, not when it's flat, when it first makes contact with the ground. Because in science, we have to define phases. So all of us in science, there's a definition. It's something you could find in a an analysis book. And so we all do the same thing so that when we're reading research and doing research, we know what we're talking about. So when the foot touches down ends the stride phase. And then we we also and we look at where the arm is at. Then we look at what's called max external rotation, which Larry, you probably know that's when the pitcher's totally square and his arm is in full external rotation, meaning his shoulder is completely stretched. He has not started to come forward with the ball. Then he, you know, internally rotates the shoulder and accelerates the ball. And then it comes out of his hand. He goes through his follow through. So we stop it at max external. We stop it at ball release and we look at the follow through. So what I did is I initially just did that. I, I put both videos next uh, next to each other and from these two years apart, and I stopped it at the top of the knee lift. Everything looked the same. I started, I stopped it at stride foot contact. Everything looked the same. I then moved each one forward to max external. It looked pretty much the same but I started noticing a difference in the position of his body. And then when I went to ball release, it looked very different. So I said, hmm, something's going on here. Even though the discrete skills, the positions of the body looked pretty much the same, except when we got, when I got to the trunk tilt part, And by the way, trunk tilt is a critical characteristic for high velocity pitchers. If the trunk isn't forward, you're not going to have high velocity because it means your body weight wasn't behind the ball completely. So it is one of those flaws. So it it kind of lit up my thinking. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a different type of analysis. And what I did is I did what we call a temporal analysis. I started them both at the exact same place. And because my computer is, you know, has a, a, an ability to do this, I started running, you know, I looked at the clock and I started taking notes to see what was happening within the motion on a temporal level, meaning was this a timing thing? Because when I looked at each position, he looked the same except for some trunk tilt and his bar release looked funny. Well, that is when I went, oh, wow. And I have never seen anything like this. And it was the most amazing thing. And the best thing about it, of course, is the pitcher. Pitchers are so happy when you can find what's, what's changed and they're so good, they know how to correct it. So I was able to help this pitcher understand, and he was blown away. So that is what I want to start with in talking about when you see a pitcher who is looking like he slowed down the hill, the kinds of things that you have to look for. But the other thing is, is this is really going to end up being a conversation about one of my favorite topics, and I think the most misunderstood part of the pitching motion, which is the way the pitcher gets from his back leg to his front leg. And that is a skill. It's a a skill called weight shift. It is never talked about. It is not taught. 
And some of the things that get in the way of that skill are things that are common that we see. Now, what I'm hoping this presentation does is show that when the weight shift is off, you can still be a good pitcher and you can actually still do a pretty good job with velocity and location. But if it's not as good as it could be, and if it's not efficient, it is going to cost you velocity. And what's so cool about this is I had a a live kind of research project right in my hands because this was the only thing wrong. This guy throws a number of pitches, throws all of them for strikes, has not lost that ability one bit, but his fastball. It's not that he lost command, he lost velocity. So if we want to reverse thinking this whole process, we can say, hey, if you can lose velocity by changing the way you initiate your movement forward, guess what? With pitchers that have some issues with not doing it correctly, we can actually start to think that they can produce a different effect at the end. And the other thing, Larry, that I thought was profound is that, as I said at the beginning, we don't really usually, you know, we don't go, oh, his stride is fast. We only notice it when it's slow. And that was the very thing you were noticing. It was so on whoever you were seeing, there was something about it that made it noticeable when really we don't usually notice it. So when it's noticeable, you know something's going on. So anyway, let's look at the first photo, and um, I want you to notice that uh, in this photo, this is the top of the knee lift, and everything looks exactly the same. So now this is the this is the comparison where I am actually doing it in timing. So they're at the top of the knee lift. The clock isn't running yet. I synchronized it to make sure it was exactly correct. In the second photo you'll notice that there is definitely a change. So this is what I I was looking for. Where is there going to be a difference? And, you know, one of the things we know about motion is that usually most errors occur at the beginning of the pitching motion. They happen before the, sometimes before the ball is even completely out of the glove. That is why it is so important to be able to look at Where is there a problem? The ball might be going slower, but it doesn't mean there's something going on with the ball or with his hand or with his shoulder. So here we have in the second slide, we see that look how far out into his stride he is and look at how not far out he is in the photo on the right. The one on the left is, of course, the older uh, high school video and the one on the right is his college video. Larry, can you see, is that difference not like totally amazing? Yeah, yeah, it's completely different. Yeah. From just maybe that move right there, you can understand maybe why it did take a little longer, you know, to get down the hill. Because he the, the photo on the right, he gets in a generic way to explain it. It's like he kicked his foot out. Yes. It's going to take the long way around to the to getting to, to, getting to the same spot. Exactly. It's going to take a longer route to get there, and he's going to swing open like a gate. Instead of maybe on the photo on the left, more efficient on the left, it looks to me. Yes, of course. Well, there's it's it's even deeper than that. So first of all, in looking at his current video, he didn't have anything unusual about his landing was good. His landing looked the same. As I said, all of the characteristics were there, but it's how you get there. This is why we have to be, you know, in the work that I do the analysis has to be more complete. So let me address what you just said, because you're absolutely 100% right. But there's a more important thing to understand here. So uh, on the left, you see that he's coming off his leg, and that is called weight shift. He's shifting his hip. The legs do not move the body forward. They cannot move the body forward. The hips move the body forward. Everybody says rear leg, drive leg, blah, blah, blah. It's the rear hip. So what's happening is the side of the hip needs to be moving him downhill. Well, in order for his left leg to kick out, 
in the direction, and you notice that, he's coming forward with his left leg. What he did there is behind the hip, so the gluteus medius, and I wish I could put up an anatomy photo, but you will be seeing some of this later in the presentation, is on the side of the body. Well, to in order for him to kick his leg out in front, he had to put a lot of effort into the back of his hip, into the glute, the, what we would call the butt muscle and the hamstring. It's complicated. But because he changed the muscle that he was using, as you can see, he starts to come off his leg, but then he interrupts the forward motion. He's actually interrupting. And in and, and the way you said, it's also correct. It's not efficient. It's not a straight line. He's interrupting the work that the ba- the hip on the side has to do by causing another muscle to work because he put his leg out to the front towards us as we're looking at it. Also notice that while his right arm looks like it's a little, e- it is kind of equidistant from the body, even though he's not off that back leg as much, but notice how his left glove arm is staying in. And that's because he has changed his center of mass. The hip is actually, when you're moving downhill, and this is true for golfers, and it's true in hitting, you're shifting your center of mass sideways, and your body becomes balanced. So if you notice on the left, he kind of looks balanced. I mean, his arms and his legs, he looks like he's in the middle of a jumping jack. On the right, his body's processing his weight. So what's that going to do? It's going to slow it down. So when I saw that, I went, oh, wow. Well, now wait till you see. And this is why I find this so dramatic. And please, everyone remember, this is a clock on a computer. This is correct analysis, meaning I'm not making this up. Take a look at the next photo and just notice that he that is his stride foot contact position that has already happened. And notice that on the right, he is not even close to that. Okay. So now we're really, so the, on the left, he's ready to start rotating, which is the next phase of the motion, which by the way, that is where you start to transfer energy into the velocity that will be transferred to the wrist through the shoulder to the wrist. He's already doing that on the left and on the right, he hasn't landed. So in the next slide, I'm looking at my presentation, you know, as I'm looking at slides, I go, oh, you know what? I think I repeated two slides that are the same here. No, he still doesn't have his foot down on the right. He looks almost like not much has changed. And then there he is on the left, rotating into his position. And then in the last slide, that uh, that was a temporal analysis slide, you will see that in the left, he is actually getting ready to deliver the ball. And on the right, his foot had just landed. That separation and the timing of that, by the way, let me get my notes here because I didn't have it in my head. There was almost a two millisecond difference or a 1.78 millisecond difference in the actual timing of this, this change. And when you convert that, when you convert that into seconds, which I did because milliseconds is something I can't even comprehend. And the pitching motion takes about two seconds. It's, it's like that. His, his motion is three fourths of a second longer to get to, to get to ball release. And that is why you you will see a difference in the type of velocity that you can produce. That's one part of it. But the other part of it is that if you're not efficient in the way you create your base, then the rotation that has to happen that actually creates the velocity, it's not going to happen in a smooth way. And it's that sort of that sort of adjustment that the pitcher's having to make. And those are the things that cost him extra seconds and cost him velocity. So in that last photo there, you actually can see 
how far ahead he was in the motion. And remember, we're dealing with milliseconds. So while this looks really like, whoa, you wouldn't notice it unless you actually did this. Now, in the next photo, so this was not a timing thing. What I said, what I did was I went back to the first style of analysis and I put them into max external first. And then, and they looked exactly the same. So even though they didn't arrive at the same time, I wanted to compare it because I wanted to see what happens next because max external is prior to acceleration. So the max external position of your shoulder gives you the next movement into bar release. And you can see in the photo how completely different the ball releases, meaning he didn't have enough behind him to get his hand out there with the straight elbow. Plus, if you'll notice on the le- on the left, because of blocking out and of course keeping him anonymous, which is critical, his trunk is leaned forward. And that's why his hand can get so far out there. In the photo on the right, his trunk is upright, and you can almost kind of infer that from the position of his legs and also from his arm. The trunk tilt is a product of the stride ending and rotating over the left leg. If you come off the back leg in a fashion that doesn't provide enough oomph to get to your front leg, you're not going to be able to rotate efficiently. And rotation directly feeds velocity. So you can almost say, wow, if your stride is off in a sense of not being powerful or directed or efficient, you're going to have a problem with the end of the motion, which is, of course, the problem he was talking to me about. Not that he couldn't locate, not that he'd become a bad pitcher, but that he lost velocity. Now, what I want to do right now is a disclaimer and, and remind everyone, when I say powerful and efficient, this does not mean fast. Don't interpret this so much as his stride is slower because it can throw off the way you're looking at it. It is not directed and efficient because a stride cannot speed down the hill because then you jar your motion and you end up with a timing delay at foot strike instead of coming off the back uh, back hip. So by learning to come off the back hip efficiently and correctly, in other words, learning how to weight shift is critical to what happens in the rest of the motion. So are you as blown away by the timing difference as I am, Larry? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Is there a is there a certain honey hole for a time? Like, is there a better time than others from, say, the moment the leg is at its highest point to release or a foot strike or actually you know what there probably there probably is in the literature because one thing that um and i'm going to be talking not talking but mentioning a, a research article that's interesting most biomechanical uh research does talk about the percentage and, and in this last article i read it said that the delivery to foot strike is about 70 percent of the motion so there isn't really that I, I can't repeat a time number, but I'm pretty sure it's in the literature. But here's the interesting thing I want to go back to. When it's efficient, you can see it. When it's not efficient, <laughs> that's when you really notice it. And this was just to me, but the thing that this speaks to, because we're dealing with a two second motion. So having a difference of 1.78 milliseconds is a huge portion of that. But the thing is, when you look at the pictures, if I ran these videos side by side at the real timing, you would not have said, oh, wow, well, you know what? His stride is uh, completely different or he's taking way longer. These things are not noticeable. This is why I don't know how anybody does anything without using film because it's just too small of increments. But what's interesting is He's not using his rear hip muscle correctly. He's getting the job done, but that incorrect usage 
caused a, has caused a problem with the rotation phase of the motion, meaning that he didn't get to the axis of rotation in the way he needed to. And it not only jarred the smooth transition rhythmically, but it limited the way that he could rotate over his hip. And the way that I know that is because, one, his trunk never tilted. When you're going forward over your front leg, you are striding out, you are moving your center of mass over to that front leg, then you are turning on top of the leg. But if you don't get on top of that axis, because let's say you didn't, have a stride that got you there, you're going to be pitching. Your center of mass is going to be more in the middle. It would be like a golfer having a backswing and the golfer has a backswing. He shifts his weight. Let's talk about a right-handed golfer. He shifts his weight to the right. He shifts, starts shifting down in the middle of his shift. He hits the ball and he's shifting all the way to the left. If he, uh, can't if he stops that weight shift just that impact that's going to affect the swing the ball everything else it's an unusual it's an error and and in fact it's probably a common error and and hitting I think you guys catch it easier because if a hitter doesn't shift his weight completely it's probably going to look so funny about the way he approaches the ball the contact etc so weight shift is a critical skill This really, to me, validates the necessity of paying attention to the details of what actually creates a good stride. And that's why I love this project, because I am a fanatic about understanding that the rear hip is how you get forward and not by any other means. Uh, Does all that make sense, Larry? Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Is there a more efficient way or better way than others to teach a kid how to use his back hip to move him efficiently down the hill? Is there a, a, a is there a teach? Is there a way to teach them how to use it correctly? Yes, you came to the right place. And I like that you used rear hip. See, you're already you're already getting into my club. I want the world to start to understand that it's the rear hip that creates the movement. Now, the back foot needs to be down so the hip can move forward. That's just you connecting it down so you can move. But the leg and the foot create no forward motion. The hip does. But I'm going to talk about, I'm going to answer your question right now, and here it comes. So let's first talk about some of the things that happen in a, what has to be understood, what has to be understood in order to start to make a correction is you have to understand what are the flaws and why, why are they flaws and, and how, what's a new way to look at it. So I put the slide up again of this picture and the, just to remind everyone, this is the difference in his stride. He did not move sideways. Now, when I was talking to this pitcher and he saw this, I said, how is there something that you change or whatever? He said a few things. And this is very common. And for coaches with young kids, please, this is the most important thing you're going to hear on uh, from this presentation. He said, I felt like I needed to stay back so that I could get, when I started losing some velocity, I thought I needed to stay back longer so I could get a little more oomph out of my stride. I said, okay, now we know, all of us know that we want, and we hear coaches teach this, stay back. We know we do not want the head and the upper body of the pitcher to lunge forward towards the bottom of the hill. We don't want that. And little kids, that's what they do. They don't know that they stride out and that we want the head staying behind the front leg, correct? We're not fencing. 
Does everybody picture that? And you know what I'm talking about, Larry, right? Say fencing again. What do you mean by fencing? You know when, you know, fencing the sport, the sport yep, where you've got okay, yep. sw- the sword and you're going towards, gotcha, right? Gotcha. Your, head's, your head's going with your arm. Gotcha. Your head, we know we want you to stay back. Well, here's the beauty. And you're and, and we're, you're right because you you there's a different process that's happening with the the center of mass for a, a pitcher. Plus he's going downhill, so you're not running. Running your head's going forward with your body. Hitting your leg goes forward and you pull your body back. Pitching you do not want the head rushing forward, and everyone knows that. And you know this is a primary thing you have to teach young kids, right? Right, absolutely. Okay, now here's the beauty of efficiency. Now look at the next photo of one of my pitchers. Now here's what I said for him to do. Now he w- has worked with me a long time, so he knew how to take instructions, but I didn't tell him anything else to do. I said, you know the muscle that we talk about all the time that initiates the stride? I said, He said, yeah. I said, I want you to contract that muscle and just do the weight shift. Don't move your, don't move, you don't have to like do a stride. Just show me the muscle. That is exactly the where the muscle itself is moving. He just shifted his center of mass, uh, center of mass forward. Excuse me for all this, this word salad I'm into right now. He's using the muscle on the side, his right side, to push his center of mass forward. I want you to notice what his shoulders and his head did. They stayed back. That is, if you, in fact, I wish I could remember if it was a physics book, if it was a biomechanical oriented kinesiology book, which is what I'm thinking. When the gluteus medius, which is the muscle, shifts the weight sideways and your feet are, you have a fixed foot, the upper body will lean towards the backside because it's doing a center of mass correction. Because what you're really doing with that muscle, and this is the definition in a biomechanics book of what it does, it shifts the center of mass forward. So if that happens naturally, if you use that muscle, you get everything you need to have a perfect stride without the head going forward. Now, if you don't teach a pitcher how to do that and you think it's his foot, which cannot move you sideways, nor can the knee, well, then You've got a kid who's trying to stay back when the body actually is probably trying to stay back anyway, and you get this over-exaggerated staying back kind of situation. So this here demonstrates a normal movement of how it looks. Now, let's go to the next photo, because what I did with this photo, and this is Nico Ratto from De La Salle High School, who I think has one of the most amazing strides and see the triangle he is loaded on the back hip and we're going to talk about that in a second and the triangle is showing the location of the gluteus medius so everyone please look it up Um, unfortunately you can't use photos you you can't trust and can't use photos that you see uh, you know just randomly off the uh, website so i decided to use the pitcher's body and that's where the muscle is at and you see he's beautifully on his back leg and then as he made his stride and he's in a perfect stride foot contact position here uh you see where that triangle is that's the muscle that he used to move himself forward And so that is the actual placement of where that muscle is. Now, there are some requirements for being able to teach this. So you see where the muscle is at by looking at the pitcher where you have your pitcher stand there and you just have him shift his weight sideways, as you see in the photo of the pitcher with the red shorts. Then you put them on balance. And you put your hand there and say, and that's where the muscle is when you're on balance. And you push out from that muscle, keep your foot down on the ground. So that's how you help them identify where the muscle is at. Now, the muscle is designed to do this so they don't have to search. 
all you're doing is bringing attention to something that's already there. So there is no selling of a bill of goods here. No one's going to go, no way, no way. That doesn't work. I don't feel it. This is how your body works. Okay. Now I couldn't help, but put myself in here because I know all of you think I'm not really real and I'm just a voice over here. (laughs) Or she doesn't work out or she doesn't do anything. Anyway, so I was working out uh, given uh, the way I look in this and I had this brilliant idea. So there is a requirement now for being able to do this. So remember in the photo you just looked at, we had Nico up on top of his back leg. You have got to be able to have a single leg balance skill in order for you to be able to move off of that leg. If you are moving off of that leg because you're falling off of it, your body weight will move forward faster, just like it does when we fall, and you will not be able to get the initiation of the weight shift. We want proper initiation of weight shift with that muscle, And if you do that, you get that look of where the top stays back. You get a straight line because guess what? There's a muscle on the other side of the body that's receiving all that. And the front leg is actually, there's a muscle on the front leg acting in a different way that that muscle acts. But you got two muscles doing the same action and it, it creates a straight line. So I'm in the gym and there's a few things I want you to notice here. So first of all, I'm on the edge of a step because that always forces someone to work harder on a balance project. And balance, by the way, there is no one type of balance. The balance you practice is the balance you're going to learn. Now, I want you to first notice that let's talk about the lower body, what I'm doing there. So I came up to the top of a knee lift. I made sure I was secure. Then to challenge it, and I'm staying over the leg, don't mistake this for a stride because, of course, if my leg's that far out, I would already be off my balance leg. But I, uh, this is an exercise. I decided to challenge my balance by taking my leg, leg and moving it sideways to my left. And then I brought it back up. And by the way, I did this three times. And somewhere in there, I was losing my balance. I remember when I was doing the repetitions, but I recovered it. This is how you practice being able to be on the back leg comfortably. Now, there's a few rules about this. So first, I have my hands somewhere where a glove would be. Because when the pitcher is on balance, his arms are not out to the side. You'll notice that if you're ever doing a balance test, if someone says, oh, stay on, stand on one leg and show me how long you can balance, your arms are going to go up to the side because it's going to help you balance. Your center of mass changes. So when your hands are in close, that center of mass changes as well. So the challenge of being able to be secure on that leg has to include for a pitcher that position. So all these exercises I see people doing like, oh, I'm working on single leg balance, but they're doing something that doesn't even look like pitching. Guess what? What you're working on is balance for that exercise, but you're not working on balance for what you're going to have to do. So Larry, you with me so far? Absolutely. It's good stuff. Great. So on my right leg, look at the center photo. I think it's easier to see. Mm -hmm. So you're going to notice in all the photos that my ankle, my knee, and my hip are completely aligned in a straight line on my standing leg. Now, from my knee up through the middle of my body is what's called the inner thigh. That's actually the partner muscle to the muscle that is on the top of the hip, moving you sideways. So in for those kinesiologists out there, your hip AB is in boy doctor is the muscle that shifts you sideways. The AD doctor is the muscle that runs up from the inside of the knee all the way through the midline of your body up to your pelvis. Now, I've got that muscle working and that muscle is pushing me backwards towards my pink gym bag there. 
that muscle is contracting, pushing me backwards, and it's pre-stretching the hip abductor muscle, which if I were going to create a stride, it would now be pre-stretched and it would give me nice power downhill, just like you pre-stretch your shoulder and then you deliver the ball. Every muscle needs a pre-stretch. Now, because you're standing, it's not like my hip's going to go way back to my right. But if you'll notice in this exercise, what's keeping me in line is the adductor. Also notice my foot. My foot does not move through this little uh, phase of motions you're seeing here. The big toe has to be down. The inside of the heel has to be down. The little toe has to be down. The outside of the heel. My bones in my shoe, right under the shoelaces, the flat bones, they're secure. The knee is bending just a little. My hip is flexing a little. Everything's in perfect alignment. That skill has to be there in order for you to have the prior skill that we saw in Nico, where when he's on balance, he's in perfect position like I am. And then that muscle is pre-stretched. And guess what? If the brain feels the muscle is pre-stretched, it knows that you're going to contract it next. Therefore, it contracts, which means its job is done. It's pushing you forward. And guess what? You get that nice straight stride. So a requirement and a teaching method is first. The first requirement is there's three things we're going to learn here. First is you've got to be able to balance and be secure and in control of your body when you're at the top of your knee lift. That's the first thing. Okay, next slide. Second requirement. Here we have Nico again. I drew a line on his inner thigh. Look how long it is. You have to be brave enough to go downhill and lengthen out the inside of your leg. In fact, there is a pitching coach, and I can't remember who it is. But when I was in graduate school, I bought books of pitching coaches that were known names. And I remember him saying something amazing. And because I was studying so much stuff in graduate school, but already had been a strength coach for pitchers, I thought, what an amazing way to say this. He said, you have to, on a stride, to create a good stride, you have to ride, R-I-D-E, ride the inside of your leg. He didn't even know what he was really saying. He was saying, stretch out the adductor while the abductor is contracting. I mean, he was like, that is kinesiology. When one muscle contracts, its opposite muscle stretches. So by allowing more of a stretch, you allow more of the contraction. This is how you see a stride be controlled down the hill, even though you're producing force at the hip. So look at that length. Now, do you think you'd be brave enough to ride out like that, Larry? Absolutely. Were you brave enough to ride out like that? Absolutely. <laughs> of For course, sure. but the, but the <laughs> other leg, right? Right. Of right. course, there's no lefty that's afraid to go down right. the hill no like way, that. No way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, last but not least, my pet peeve in motion here. I'm going to click on this little picture here. Now, that is the knee joint. That is called a valgus knee. You've heard that term because they talk about valgus elbow, blah, blah, blah. These are forces on a joint that you don't want. When I was in graduate school, I learned that hip abduction was how you created the stride. I interviewed over 100 pitchers. How do you get to your front leg? That's all I asked. Uh, the knee, um, the ankle, uh, the push the you drop nobody said the hip most people said the knee this is what you see on most pitchers and by the way in football this is a 15 yard penalty if you hit 
a player and push his knee in like that. That's how dangerous that position is. And it drives me crazy that pitchers do this. And when you turn the knee in like that, it, it you're starting to change the center of mass of your body. So guess what you're going to do? You're going to tilt way backward, lean back, because now you've got a part of your body going forward. It's going to shift everything. And it will not allow, in fact, it interferes with the gluteus medius doing its job fully because now you've got the knee leading the way and that shifts everything. Now, here's why I think this error happens. And this is another thing that I learned in in physics or something. Whenever the body moves sideways, the brain lowers your center of mass. So picture a basketball player. Let's say he walks up and now he wants to guard the guy with the ball he's going to immediately lower. If I say to you, shuffle sideways, you're going to immediately lower. We lower down to move sideways. Lowering down means that your body's going down. But most people lower down from their knee joint. And I think what happens is the pitcher's thinking, I got to bend my knee. And when he bends it, it rolls in or he turns it in or he's tur- he's bending it down and turning it in towards the direction that he's going, thinking that the leg's going to take him in that direction. So th- it's easy for me to see why this is done, but it's an error. And just as a strength coach, when I would see this, I'd go, why, isn't, why aren't physical therapists and surgeons jumping in saying, hey, guys, We need a new way to teach a stride. You got to stop turning that knee in like that. And I think there's some that do it to such a degree that it's, I don't know how they don't have knee problems. Larry, you've seen this, right? Yes, I have. Yeah, the internally rotated knee. I've had some guys, especially I remember in the minor leagues, I had some guys that in route to the plate, you know, as they begin to stride to the plate, to tilt their hips to lead with their glove hip and it caused them to get, in my opinion, too tilted. Would that, would something like that, would that kind of teach cause, cause this or not? Do you think? Well, so first of all, one of the things, one of the things this muscle does, not to confuse everyone, but it moves you sideways, but it also pulls your pelvis down onto your leg. In fact, when you see people that can't walk correctly, There's a particular name for it, the Trendelenburg gait. You'll see people take a step and they're dragging their other leg through. It's because the gluteus medius has lost its its weakness or they've had nerve damage. So there's not enough room for the leg to pull through. Let me back up and say one thing to remind everybody, you've heard me say this before, you're suspended from the bottom of your head, okay? Your weight transfers down from that through the hips into the biggest bone in the lower leg. That's how you're at, you're standing. So in order for us to be healthy and do things normally, our pelvis, which is the big square, you know, if you go from pocket to pocket, there's a big bone under there. Think of it as a rectangle. That has to stay level. And when it's level, the legs, as they shuffle through and you're walking, you your legs fit. So one of the things that muscle does is it pulls the leg down. So if the pitcher is told to raise up that left hip to move out the glove side and he tilts downward, he's actually the gluteus medius is now working as a downward pull onto the femur and it will with other muscles start to move the body sideways. What that pitching coach said incorrectly was is that the left leg would then pull him out. Just so you know, And this is something you've also heard me say, because I think it's funny. I think it's funny. And I have heard people say this. The way you get down the hill is by your front leg. And I always say, but the front leg's not on the ground. You can't go anywhere with the leg that's not on the ground. You can swing that leg. But if you don't move off of the back hip, you're not going anywhere. So the front hip can't pull you down. But what he didn't realize he was saying is, tilt backwards to load the back hip, 
not absolutely correctly. He's using a little compensation movement, but that's what he was teaching. The risk you run with that is you get other muscles doing the work. Plus, don't we want our pitchers level? Yeah. And don't we want their arms level? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Now, there's some guys that get their glove arm way up in the air and they look like a little like they're doing a, a, a cartwheel, right? Or they look like a little and we hate it. And sometimes they pull it off. Remember, there are pitchers that can pull off anything because I, I, there's some great pitchers with mechanics that make me go, ouch. But when we are teaching or more than that, when we're troubleshooting. You see, my job is to troubleshoot. My job isn't to go around and say, I don't care if you're throwing 100. I want you to throw right. My job is to be there when the guy throwing 100 says, I think I can throw 105. Could you tell me where I'm not getting the best out of my body or I'm hurting my shoulder? Something hurts. I'm worried about my 100 mile hour velocity. Can you show me where in my motion I might be hurting it? That's my job. When we teach, we want to kind of teach the best way. And you know, Larry, the more linear you are, I mean, pitching is a go downhill in a straight line, turn on that axis, and then throw the ball towards that plate. So everything's from the rubber to the plate, and that's a straight line. The more you tilt, and I know you use terms like north and south, east, east and west, we don't want east and west. We want north and south, straight down the center and level. So when you spin, you know, if you put a plate on the table and you try to spin it, if that table's flat, it's going to go really fast. But if you don't have it level and you try to spin it, it's going to like slow down or it's going to fall off. So spinning and turning should be done. That's why when we see uh, an ice skater or anybody, a pirouette or whatever, that's done. That is practice to be done on a perfect plane of action. So he was, he probably felt something. He didn't explain it. But what he did accomplish is loading that back leg by dumping the body weight backward onto it. But as a method of teaching, it's probably not correct. Right, right. Interesting. So you see how I'm level in my uh, in, in that exercise I was doing. Yes. I okay. That's the way to do it because then you're allowing freedom. If there's a muscle that's supposed to do something, guess what? Whatever you're doing, you're going to do it better. That's why in sports training we look for efficiency of the use of muscles. And our body has a muscle. For example, the muscle on the side of the shoulder, the middle deltoid, it is designed to raise the arm up to the side. So when you're doing a jumping jack, it's designed to do that. In pitching, both your shoulders have to come up to shoulder height, like a jumping jack, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pitchers get into configurations with their arms behind them, in front of them, they're raising their arms up with other fibers in the shoulder that guess what? Don't do as good of a job. So now you've got arms that get up late or whatever. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There is a way. That's why I love my work. Kinesiology. It's balanced. It's, and the body doesn't change every day. You know, you're not going to hear me in three years talk about the stride or the gluteus medius any other way. This is the way it is. This is the way your body's designed. This is what it does. That doesn't change. Now, how you use it or take advantage of its efficiency is up to you. But when you're looking at something like your guys or you, whoever you looked at that said, man, he's moving slow. Now you kind of can look to say, OK, well, the only thing that I can could see being slow is it's got to be his downhill motion which means it's got to be the way he's coming off his back leg. So the initiation of the stride creates the stride. So all of us in the world, we do not have to worry about the stride. If you worry about the initiation and you do that correctly, that leg's going to go straight out. And guess what else solves itself? Where the foot goes. Because the foot is attached to the leg, which is coming out of the hip. And if your hips are moving perfectly sideways, then 
your foot's going to be following it. That's actually how we walk around. So the next time you're walking, notice how you don't have to think about that. Cool stuff, huh? Kinesiology. I love it. Very good. Very good. Yes. A lot of teachings to me are non teaches They're unnecessary if you teach a person how to use his back hip correctly. Exactly. A lot of the other things are just non teaches because if you use it correctly, you will stay back. You won't rush out. You'll, exactly. you'll move downhill efficiently and, and on time and what is a good time for you. And it's not too slow and it's not too fast. And, yes. And in fact, Larry, that's why I was, I was going to try to figure out how to add that in when you asked me What's the perfect timing to get down the hill? See, we have to be really careful about that. And a lot of people get ground reaction force mixed up in this too. There are ground reaction forces that occur about 30% of the body weight on the back leg. He lands with about 70%. But guess what? If you're coming off the leg with the bent knee, like that last photo, Your ground reaction force is going to be different because you got a lot of weight placed on probably a different part of your foot than the guy who's like Nico, who's completely balanced on top of his leg. When he pushes off, he's using a different part of his foot because he's in control and he used his hip. So his foot stayed down to accommodate the hip. The body does that naturally. So when you're looking at numbers, this is why I don't like a lot of numbers. We get ideas from them. We know this weight in the front is going to be more because it's the whole body's landing on it. But we, this is why I didn't go into biomechanics because you can misunderstand. If you don't understand how the muscles are used and how they're being used, you're not going to even be able to interpret the data. This is what scares me about, you know, the stuff that goes on with pictures and data. You have to understand Like if somebody says, don't throw a fastball because your spin rate's down or whatever. The first thing I would say is, hey, show me your fingers and your hand. Show me that grip. Uh, Do this with your wrist. Uh, Pull this. Let me see that finger strength. I'm not like, oh, my God, don't throw that fastball. He's going to hit it out of the yard. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, wait a minute. It's an indicator because unless the pitcher has a deformed hand, He's got the ability to do whatever you as his coach wants him to do. You just have to look at the right thing. This is why I have said every season of my nine seasons, you're being expected to understand anatomy in order to really know how to make a change or how to even look at a change that needs to be made. This is why I've always felt you guys are given too much. They don't ask you to do the accounting for the team, do they? They don't even ask you to do the data analysis. They know enough to know that, well, we're going to buy this machine, but we need somebody to interpret it. You know, they don't even, I mean, it's so funny how in, in baseball, they do separate and give everyone a job. Why they don't have somebody doing this to help you? You should have an assistant by your side all the time where you say, hey, Angel or whoever, look how slow he's going. I can see I can see his stru- something's wrong. And then it gets out. But this is why I have the podcast. You got that right. No, this is good. It's really good stuff. Oh, awesome. So. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank everyone for helping me have a ninth season. I am so excited. I can't believe it's been nine seasons. (laughs) Me either. Heck, I remember when I first listened and reached out and it seems like it doesn't seem that long ago, but it has been. This is my ninth year at Bellarmine and that's about the time I reached out. Yes. Well, it's been great. And I appreciate so much your time because uh, uh, no way do I want to sit here and just teach. It's so great to have your feedback and your questions because you represent the listeners. And so I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in. And also my take home message for this is please pitchers fall in love with the beginning of your motion fall in love with that part make it the most efficient and the best that it can be and guess what you won't have to worry about the rest that's my message so thank you everyone for listening and don't forget to visit my website angel borelli pitching you can find this podcast uh, any place that you get your podcasts 
And of course, listen to this podcast and some of my others on Angel Borelli pitching on YouTube. So thank you again. And thank you again, Larry. No worries. Thank you for having me.